If you've watched any of the videos on this channel, you've heard me talk about the importance of building your skills and talking about your skills and being an asset to whatever department you want to work on. Well, I actually got a really good question the other day in the comments and I wanted to make an entire video out of it. It is from Nick Wallmeyer and it says, could you do a video on all the specialty jobs in the department and the work they do slash training to get the certifications? Just an idea. I like your videos. Well, thank you, Nick, for saying that you like the videos, but I really like this idea for content because a lot of people think that uh, being a firefighter means you just fight fires and that's it. And that's not necessarily the case. Now, of course, there's men and women in the fire service that that's what they do. They're all their focus is on firefighting and that's it. But a lot of firefighters have other certifications or other skills um, that they bring to the table and that integrate themselves into other specialty teams, either in their region, their district, their county, or even just their department. So in this video, I'm gonna go over some of the common ones that are out there. You're gonna hear me talk a lot about the NFPA. Um, if you're un unfamiliar with the NFPA and what that is, they're essentially uh, the National Fire Protection Association. What they are is they, they're a, a regulatory body, I guess would be the best way to say it, that um, makes the rules and regulations for how fire departments should operate. Now they talk about, there's hundreds of different NFPA codes. Uh, they range from everything from what kind of fire hose you're supposed to have, to how you're supposed to refurbish an old engine, to turnout gear regulations, to uh, all sorts of stuff. So you'll hear me talk about some NFPA codes, and I'll put a link down below where you can see all the different NFPA codes and what's covered in them. Um, because a lot of these other specialties that I'm going to talk about in this video uh, are outlined in what's necessary as far as training uh, in the NFPA codes. So the first one I want to talk about is hazardous material. Now, hazmat training is something that almost every fire department has at some level. Now, I believe, I know in Ohio, I think it's different in every state, but I believe that in order to have a Firefighter 2 certification, you have to get to the operations level. Uh, other firefighter certifications allow you to have just the awareness level, which brings me to my next point about hazmat. Uh, there's th three main different certification levels. The first one is awareness, and that is essentially uh, just what it sounds like. If you are trained to the hazmat awareness level, it's essentially just trains you for what to look for, what to watch out for when there's some sort of hazardous incident or material and to go notify other people. The next level up from that is operations, and uh, that's what most full-time career firefighters are trained to that level. Operations, again, is exactly what it kind of sounds like. People that are hazmat operators are the people that are probably gonna be showing up first on scene after 911 or whoever is called. Um, and they're the ones that determine how far away everyone should be, essentially how to begin what other resources do we need? How do we start mitigating this problem? And then after that is the third level, which is the technician and the specialist. Now, I think there's a difference. I'm, I'm not a hazmat expert. There's a difference between technician and specialist, and I'm not exactly sure what the, what the intricacies are between the two. But essentially, the technician and or the specialist is the person, if you've ever seen a hazmat incident, the person in the big yellow suit uh, going in and actually dealing with the hazardous material. Uh, that's the technician, that's the specialist. They're the people that actually go fix the problem. Uh, that is the highest level of hazmat certification that you can get. Um, that is a lot of training. Hazmat is its own specialty. People that are into hazmat are really into hazmat. And if you're not into hazmat, it can be pretty boring. I'm just going to warn you. Doesn't mean that it's not important. Doesn't mean that it's, that it's not necessary because it is, but it's a very niche thing that's not for everyone. But if you're interested in getting on a fire department or maybe you want to expand your skills within the fire department and bring more value to, to your crew, uh, consider upping your hazmat uh, certification levels. It's something that's necessary. Almost every fire department has hazmat. Number two is technical rescue slash search and rescue. Now, this is also really, really popular. Technical rescue is kind of an umbrella term that encompasses all sorts of other things underneath it. It includes, excuse me, it includes uh, rope rescue, confined space, building collapse, wilderness rescue, low and high angle rescue. Um, if you want to be a tech rescue person, you need to get really comfortable with ropes. You also need to uh, have a passion. How do I say this? You have to have a passion for rappelling, climbing, belaying, things like that. It's not, again, it's not for everyone, um, but it's also a very, very important job within the fire service. 
um, you see these these uh, like electrical these t tall electrical towers or cell phone towers. Unfortunately, there's people out there that think it's a good idea to climb those. Well, somebody needs to go rescue them. That's probably going to be tech rescue. Same thing with construction sites where uh, if they're digging a big trench and it's not secured properly and there's some sort of collapse, they call it tech rescue. Conversely, if there's some sort of building collapse, and I know a lot of places out in uh, wildland res uh, with wildland fires, they'll need search and rescue. Search and rescue are also the same people that go in and dig through rubble after, a, after an incident with building collapse. Technical rescue encompasses a lot of stuff and there's a lot of specific training that you need to go through to get certified. Now, uh, the NFPA has uh, code 1670 and 1006 are the ones that I found that deal with technical rescue. There may be more in the codes. There's hundreds of different codes, so I didn't go through all of them. But if you're interested in that, check the link I put below that has all the NFPA regulations and you can find out a little bit more about it. The next one is water rescue. Now, water rescue can mean a whole bunch of stuff. If you live somewhere like I do where it gets cold and the water freezes, um, ice rescue is a big thing. People fall through the ice, people messing around thinking they can go ice skating, play hockey, and they fall through the ice. Actually, that just happened the other day. I saw it on the news. Um, also, swift water, uh, rapid water. Um, if there's a lot of flooding in your area, that can get kind of dangerous and people get trapped in their homes, people get trapped in their cars. Um, part of water rescue is learning how to deal and cross the swift water and rescue people from that. It's its own unique kind of subspecialty in water rescue, but it's also very important. The uh, fire department I used to work for before I came to where I am now had a pretty big swift water team because they had a, a river that moved pretty quick. So not all departments have that. If you live somewhere that's landlocked, you may have to, if you are into water rescue or something like that, you may have to join a county team. Not all the, It's expensive. So not all departments have an entire team or have the resources to dedicate several people to that. Uh, but it might just be a regional or county sort of team. Uh, what else do I have on that? As far as water rescue goes, I didn't find any NFPA codes, but uh, PADI, which is the Professional Association of Dive Instructors, are the people that do all the sort of scuba certifications, all the rescue certifications for anything in the water. Now, I'll put the link for them below if that's something that you're interested in. Essentially, what you'll have to start out with is the first level is you'll get what's called your open water certification, which really just teaches you the basics of <clears throat> how to dive how to use your scuba tank, uh, how to descend, how to ascend, uh, what to do if you lose your mouthpiece, just all sorts of stuff, the very basics of diving. From there, you can go into advanced open water, you can go into public safety diving, rescue diving. There's also, there's just go on the link below, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. There's tons of different options as far as that goes. Uh, the next one is SWAT and Bomb Squad. Now, where I work, I don't know of any fires that are, or firefighters that are on a bomb squad team, but I know there are fire departments in the area that do do stuff with bomb squads. So I am not an expert on what that is and what they look for, but my guess would be that it's something similar to uh, how firefighters are also on SWAT teams. Now you may ask, why would a firefighter be on a SWAT team? And that's a good question. Usually what SWAT teams are looking for is they are looking for paramedics. Now, if you're just an EMT, don't take offense to that. Chances are SWAT teams are looking for paramedics because they want people that will be able to be trained and have the highest level um, and the most leeway to do as much as possible to help and rescue people. Now, what a SWAT medic does is essentially they go to a class and they become uh, EMT tactical class, I think is what they call it, um, and they get trained just like any other SWAT officer. Now they don't have necessarily all of the exact, they don't do necessarily all of the same things, but what their responsibility is, is to be attached to that team, uh, whether it be county, local, whatever. And um, if anybody is injured or harmed during an incident, whether it be a police officer or the person that the, that the uh, police are after, your job is to rescue that person. So, some people get really, 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 really into this. It's not for everyone, um, but just know that a lot of departments have that. Now, usually, for example, where I work, we have one guy that is on the county SWAT team. Um, other places close by me, they break it into regions, and they'll have a northwest, a northeast, southeast, southwest region. 
and they'll just pool their resources together and they'll pull random people from different departments that are medics to join that SWAT team and be attached to them. Anytime there's a SWAT call out for some sort of serving warrants or drug raids or whatever, they'll go out with them. So that's how that usually works. Uh, next one, fire inspector and or fire investigator. Now, this is also, it's similar to hazmat, not in the sense of you're doing similar things, but it's similar in the sense of it is very, very book heavy. If you want to be in fi a fire inspector or a fire investigator, you're going to become intimately familiar with building codes because that's the main part of your job. You're going to be going to different buildings and offices and businesses in the area, inspecting the buildings, making sure that they're safe, they're up to code, there's no obvious hazards, and you're going to be enforcing that. Now, again, this is a very niche thing and it's not for everyone. The reason being is because it's so code heavy and if that's not really what you join the fire service to do or you're not very interested in, you're gonna get bored really, really quick. The cool thing about being an inspector or an investigator is whether it be while you're still on the job or after the job, you have some pretty cool uh, private sector job prospects. What do I mean by that? Uh, fire inspectors and people with that sort of knowledge and certification, uh, insurance companies are very interested in what you can do. Also, law firms are very interested in what you can do. They want to know, for, for instance, if there's a house fire and an insurance company isn't sure if this was set purposefully or not, they will bring in a fire inspector to tell them, hey, give me a full report of what you, your opinion is on this. Similarly, what law firms will do when they go into litigation, they'll bring in people with expert uh, knowledge or training to be an expert witness during the process of litigation. Now, you can make a boatload of money doing that. But what I will warn you again is you, A, you actually have to know what you're doing, but B, you, it is very boring if doing that kind of code heavy reading is not for you. But just know that that's something else that's in a fire department that is a specialist sort of training or class that you can go to and get into. Uh, next one is a fire EMS or CPR instructor. <clears throat> now, all firefighters, all EMS is required to do continuing education. And a lot of departments are interested in having people on their department within their ranks that are actual certified instructors, whether it be fire, EMS, whatever. And I know some of the firefighters out there, I've gotten some comments that say, this is stupid, I'm not interested in EMS, I just want to fight fire. That's fine. That's completely fine. You don't need to be an EMS instructor. But just know, for the most of you, uh, the fire service is moving closer and closer towards fully integrating with EMS. Now, that can be a debate for some people in what big cities and whether that's good or bad. That's not the point. I'm not here to debate that. What I am saying is departments are keenly interested in people that have EMS certifications. So going forward, if you do have an EMS certification, look into becoming an EMS instructor because people are going to constantly need to get refreshed on their continuing education, whether it be for fire, uh, EMS. CPR, I think every firefighter out there has to be at least CPR qualified, um, but also a lot of fire departments will do CPR classes with the community. It's a great community outreach tool to do CPR classes at the fire department one night a week. So if you can be that person, that guy or that girl on your department that has your, C your AHA card, and again, I'll put the links for that down below if you're interested in finding out more about those things, whether it be EMS or uh, AHA or CPR instructor, just check that out. It'll go through all the different certifications in the classes that you need to take. Uh, next one is apparatus operator. Now the NFPA code that I found that kind of deals with that is uh, NFPA 1002. Now apparatus operator is pretty general. What that usually means is the engineer. Uh, being the person that drives the fire engine and operates the pump is its own specialty in a lot of places, especially in larger departments. Where I work, it's just a single department. Uh, I think there's 30 people, 31 people total. Um, we kind of rotate through that. We have to know a little bit about everything. But I know other departments don't do that, and that's its own position where that's what you do is you're an engineer. Now, conversely, all these ladder trucks, rescue trucks, uh, there's, there's all sorts of different apparatus out there to operate, and a lot of departments will use them as their own, that'll be its own specific job. That's a test you can take, it's specialty training as far as how to run those things, um, and it's kind of a cool job if that's something that you're into. Now, again, some people might say, no, I don't want to do that, I just want to go in on fires 
that's great. Do that for 20 years and then your back's going to start hurting. You might be more interested in becoming an apparatus operator. But just know that there's classes and certifications that you can get in the meantime to work closer and closer to, towards that. The last two aren't, that I have here aren't really their own job per se, but it's something else that I know fire departments have on hand. Uh, and one is there are certain SCBA certifications that you can get. Uh, where I work, we use Scott Packs. I know MSA is another person, uh, or another person, another big company out there that uh, makes SCBA bottles and packs and air packs. Um, knowing how to fix those things is its own little specialty. We have two guys on my department that I don't know if they got actual certifications from, we, like I said, we use Scott from Scott or where they got them or where they learned this. Um, but they're our go to guys. If there's something goes wrong with an air pack or a bottle, they're the first people that we, we contact and say, hey, this isn't working. And then they go back and tinker with it and fix it or send it out to Scott or whatever. The other one, in this one might seem a little odd, uh, is a car seat tech. I know that that sounds kind of weird coming from a fire department, but a lot, it's a great, again, a great community outreach tool. I think we have two or three guys on our department who have our car seat certified. I didn't even know this was a thing. To put a car seat in a car, a lot of there's a there's a special certification for that. Obviously, you can do it yourself if you want. Um, but if you go to the hospital, they have child life specialists that have these certifications. But also, a lot of fire departments will have people that are car seat certified, so that if there are residents that are expecting a child or maybe their grandparents or something, um, and they need a car seat installed and they don't want to do it themselves or don't know how to do it or they're just not comfortable doing it. Uh, you can go to a class, get some specialty certification for it, and then people will come to the department and um, have you put your car seat in for you. So those are just some of the most common uh, other jobs, specialty jobs, things that you can do. There's all sorts of classes out there. Look up some information if any of those sounded interesting to you or something that you might want to get into. Whether you already are a firefighter or you're not a firefighter, having those certifications, having those knowledge, if nothing else, will make you look more appealing to a department if you're looking to get onto a department. So I hope you found that useful and helpful. As always, if you did, please give this video a like, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel. This video has really been taking off recently and I appreciate each and every one of you that have subscribed. And I, I will uh, see you guys in the next video.